Okay, we're going to get started. Hello. Doug, if we could dim the lights uh, just a little bit. Got a few slides. I want to welcome you all to a discussion on the subject of social entrepreneurship uh, with two uh, very prominent contemporary social entrepreneurs, uh, Jonathan Rose and Edward Norton. Um, I'd like to first thank Interbrand for helping uh, uh, make this possible, uh, sponsoring a conference that's being held here at the GSD on corporate citizenship. Before I introduce uh, Jonathan and Edward, I'd like to tell you a little bit about James Rouse. Just raise your hand if you know about James Rouse. Okay, raise your hand if, if you don't know who I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you don't even know why you're here. No, okay. okay. Uh, this is James Rouse in 1981 saying cities are fun. Um, anybody who knows a thing or two about uh, post-World War II America might want to debate a little bit how fun cities were in 1981, just a few years after New York City almost uh, went bankrupt. But uh, Jim Rouse, as one of the country's most prolific uh, real estate developers, had a profound influence on the built environment in the US. In 1995, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in honor, in honor of his 50-year career and his service to society. Uh, President Clinton, down in the lower left there, um, hailed Rouse as an American hero who helped to heal the torn out heart of America's cities. Rouse deeply cared about the social consequences of development and he used the tools and methods of capitalism and entrepreneurship to advance his social agenda. Our two speakers tonight, in many respects, are following a similar trajectory. Next slide, there we go. Rouse built his first shopping center in 1956 and insisted it would be racially integrated, which at the time went directly against the prevailing norms. According to Rouse, white merchants, like most other whites in those days, were unprepared for racial integration. Columbia, Maryland, a town that Rouse planned and built on 16,000 acres of land, of farmland between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and which today has a population of about 100,000, was from its beginning in the 1960s a socially progressive and racially integrated city at a time when housing segregation was still the norm. Columbia was designed not only to preempt the piecemeal development of typical suburbia, but also to eliminate the racial, religious, and income, and income uh, segregation. This is Faneuil Hall in Boston. Rouse was an early agent of change to improve conditions in cities, in the urban core, uh, with uh, what he referred to as festival marketplaces, such as Boston's uh, uh, Faneuil Hall. Next slide. After retiring from commercial real estate development, Rouse founded Enterprise Community Partners, which to date has funneled an astonishing $10 billion uh, into 270,000 units of affordable housing throughout the country. Both Edward, who was Rouse's grandson, and Jonathan, who you might say is a spiritual de descendant, if not uh, biological, um, are very active members of Enterprise's Board of Trustees. Uh, in this picture, Edward is testifying to Congress on behalf of Enterprise. Edward and Jonathan, and Jonathan both were instrumental in urging Enterprise to bring the benefits of green building into the affordable housing sector. As a result of their leadership, Enterprise launched its Green Communities Initiative in 2004 and within five years had invested over $700 million to support 17,000 green affordable, green affordable homes. Uh, earlier this year, Edward uh, became a, a, good, uh, a UN Goodwill Ambassador for Biodiversity. In accepting the appointment, Edward said, the connection between human well-being and the web of biodiversity, biodiversity is incontestably the defining challenge of our era.
Among the many other philanthropic organizations that he supports, Edward created a US-based nonprofit to provide strategic leadership and financial support for the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, an authentic grassroots organization with deep roots and excellent credibility in the community. The Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust provides wildlife conservation, healthcare, and educational programs to an indigenous population of 7,000 Maasai on a 300,000 acre group ranch in Kenya. Maasai people and their tribal lands are threatened by conflicts between people and wildlife, by water shortages, subdivision of land, and the economic pull of urban life. Success or failure of this ecosystem will have far-reaching consequences for millions of people uh, living downstream from these watersheds. One of Edward's newest social entrepreneurial ventures that some of you may know about is the social networking site CrowdRise that helps users to initiate grassroots fundraising efforts. This grew out of a prototype website that was created for the uh, MWCT fundraising effort that involved Edward, three Maasai tribesmen, and two dozen other volunteers who raised $1.2 million by running in the 2009 New York Marathon. Uh, this year, CrowdRise partnered with the New York Marathon organizers uh, to raise $30 million for a variety of charities. And that's just uh, crowdrise.com for any of you who'd like to check it out. Jonathan Rose has spent the last 20 years developing a multitude of sustainable, transit accessible, mixed income communities that are designed to repair and strengthen the fabric of cities, towns, and villages while preserving the land around them, uh, which sounds uh, like something Jim Rouse might have, uh, might have said in his day. Uh, Jonathan played a critical role in developing the Enterprise Green Communities Criteria, which are the first national framework for green affordable housing. Jonathan knew from his own experience that green and affordable housing could be one and the same. By implementing an integrative design process, green can be achieved for little or no additional upfront cost and can provide significant lifetime cost savings. There we go. Uh, Jonathan's practice is organized into four complementary areas, policy and planning, development, owner's representation, and investment. Jonathan also supports the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship, whose mission is to inspire and nurture a new generation of architects as lifelong le leaders dedicated to creating sustainable communities for people at all income levels. There we go. Uh, Jonathan supports many other organizations. He's on the board of the American Museum of Natural History, of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the National Resources Defense Council, the ULI. Also, Jonathan is a founder of the Garrison Institute that applies the transformative power of contemplation to today's pressing social and environmental concerns, helping to build a more compassionate and resilient uh, future. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll move to our, pan our, our speakers. So if you could uh, help me in welcoming Jonathan and Edward to come up. <laughs> and, and just to let you know, we're going to spend uh, about a third or a half of our, our talking time uh, up here, but then we're going to open it up to questions. So. If any of you want to start thinking of your, your questions. Um, I have a few of my own, and I, I want to welcome, invite both of you. Uh, oh, Jonathan, this is for you, in case you need it. Thank you. And I want to welcome you to, uh, to ask each other questions. But uh, I'll ask uh, a, a few to get the ball rolling. Um, I'd like to ask both of you, what are your first memories of Jim Rouse, and how has he influenced your thinking and your work, uh, both at Enterprise and, and your, in your other ventures? Um, Jonathan, you know, when did you first meet Rouse, and under what circumstances? So I first met Jim Rouse in this room in 1975. Um, he was a complete role model, inspirational person for me, and leader, uh, 
what he was doing was so extraordinary. It's, what he's done, what he did throughout his life was so extraordinary, but when you think about the time in which he did it, it was even more extraordinary. And I was then a graduate student at University of Pennsylvania studying ecological planning with Ian McHarg, which, um, and came, he was speaking at GSD, I found out, I took the train up, I sat on those steps over there, the room was completely packed, and uh, probably against the fire code, and um, then went up and shook his hand. And Edward? Um, well, you know, I, I, there, I don't have any period in my life where I, where I don't have memories of him, uh, because I, I grew up with him, but, um, you know, for a long time in my life, he was mostly a, a perplexing adult in that he never wore <laughs> color-coordinated clothes or suits. Um, he often wore floppy fishing hats with the lures in them and um, was not, not uncommon to see him in, like, a Madras jacket with Kelly green pants and a, like, he, he was the most uncoordinated um, human being <laughs> on the planet. Uh, and he was very funny and had a, a really hilarious, infectious laugh, and um, most, mostly was just a, a very jovial grandfather. But uh, um, I think that, you know, I, I, I guess when I was, you know, in my teens, I, I was always aware, obviously, of his sort of, not so much his fame, but that people, people who came around him were very, um, like, devote, devoted to him. He, he had a... Uh, he inspired a very um, exuberant energy in people, and I think <clears throat> in my teens I started having an awareness that, you know, that that what he was doing was 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 significant, was pioneering. That he had done, you know, that he had been involved et ethically in some sense in things that we were learning about in school, and that he that he had had really been at the vanguard of certain. Um, thought movements, not even, not even strictly in the sense of urban philosophy or, or development <coughs> philosophy, but, but actually really almost like ethical philosophy. He, had a, he, was a, he was a very, very ahead of his time in terms of um, social ethics and, and business as a component of social ethics. He, he was you know, saying things in the 40s and 50s about the, the role of, of business being um, not profit, but to provide an authentic service from which profit is the natural derivative. And, you know, he, it was, it was, um, he was a very, very inspiring person on, on many levels. Um, you know, I think uh, he was also, he was also uh, really exhaustingly indefatigable. I mean, he really was one of these people who had rocket fuel in his veins, he, I, I watched him well into his 80s, you know, just wear down <laughs> successions of young people who worked with him who would all end up asleep on a train around him as he continued to talk and talk and talk about things. And um, so I, I think a lot of his, his productivity came from some, some um, incredible just uh, source of energy that he had. Um, you know, and I, and I think uh, he's, he remains, he remains for, Almost, I think almost everybody who worked with him and encountered him, he re he remains a very active uh, presence and and inspiration because he um, and I think in a specific sense tying even to some things I've worked on like CrowdRise and other things, he 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 really I think Jonathan can say he really one of the great things about him was he never he never made um, you know social engagement social activism entrepreneurship. Things. He never made these things sort of um, weighty. He was a very, very fun. He was a very fun person. He he made these things seem uh, fun, organic, uh, like something you actually wanted to choose to do over go be a managing director at Dean Whittier. You know what I mean? And 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 he got people to leave. He got people to leave sort of fast track lives and come work for these causes that he worked on. He, he inspired people to pursue, I think, a mission-driven sense of, li of their lives. And that, that's, um, you know, pr pretty amazing. Um, you say mission-driven uh, uh, life. I've heard, Jonathan, you talk about 
your, your firm as being a mission-driven uh, firm. Are there other ways in which uh, Rouse influences your work going forward? Um, I, <clears throat> entirely. I mean, the reason I'm, I'm pausing is it's not there are ways. It's, so first of all, he had a holistic view about community. So here is the guy who, who is saying, I'm going to be a real estate developer, inventing new forms like the enclosed shopping mall, the, the whole new town movement in America. Was, it, he reinvented in, in the 60s and early 70s. And so he was doing all that, but he was saying, but the issue of civil rights, the issue of environment, the issue of preserving open space, these are integral. They're not like, they're not flavors, they're not separate. And, separate. and so uh, the issues of quality of education, I mean, he's deeply involved. The issue of the revitalization of cities, they're all tied together. He saw the whole. And, and so that, um, and we try to see the whole. So we try and be as comprehensive in, in our view. And what you really see, for example, is that poverty, health, and the environment are deeply intertwined, that you can't take any one piece away. Uh, the, um, you can't revitalize great cities without having, or low-income neighborhoods and cities without having great schools. In fact, when you look at a greening strategy, it's not just about making the building greener, it's also about, uh, so if you want people to live in cities and in higher densities, if you have amazing schools, they'll do that. If you have amazing school, don't have amazing schools, they won't. They're all tied together, and that was really something that he saw deeply. Okay, I, I'd like to read a short quote from Rouse. For many years, I have lived uncomfortably with the belief that most planning and architectural design suffers for lack of real and basic purpose. The ultimate purpose, it seems to me, must be the improvement of mankind. Uh, here, Rouse is advocating for the idea that development should propose, uh, promote a certain set of civic uh, uh, values, if you will. Um, uh, and clearly, many of his ventures, such as enterprise, um, uh, you know, were vehicles for him to make manifest this philosophy. Um, what do you think is the, the, the purpose of urban development? So, America is going to grow by to 400 million people. By, it's going to grow by about 90 million people by 2050. 20, the world's going to grow to about 9.6 billion people. People are growing more prosperous. There's a whole a series of issues that are happening ahead of us. But the reality is, as people become more prosperous, consume more, and the population goes up by 50%, we are already far overreaching our ability to sustainably live on Earth in an environmental and a social economic framework with 6.7 billion people. The only way that we are going to solve this problem of population growth is going to be in cities. Um, if we uh, cities, by the way, so people who live in New York City consume 25% of the energy, the people who live in suburban areas because they're not driving, etc. Cities are areas of increased environmental efficiency, economic efficiency. Uh, you, women, poor women who move to cities have much lower um, uh, birth rates. Their children, girls particularly, have much higher educational opportunity. The cities are, are cauldrons of Invention. If you look at what's happening in Africa, for example, with cell phones, these cell phone entrepreneurs rewiring cell phones to become computers, amazing. Uh, at any rate, the solutions are going to be urban. I mean, there are rural solutions we need, too. And one of the great things about putting people in the city is actually get the pressure off biodiversity. And many of the people in the audience are designers or planners of one form or another. What advice would you give them in terms of what, what role they should play in, in bringing, it, bringing about this emerging uh, world? There's not one role to play. There's the, the role, the best role to play is the one that's most authentic for who you are and for some of you to be to work with an amazing large company and for some of you to be, to be a sole entrepreneur or to work with a small company or to be an independent designer. We, you know, but the key is to do it with your whole being and to do it in the place and the way that makes the most sense for you. Um, uh, what amazes me is how many extraordinary models there are. Uh, there's not just one, one model. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would add to that that I think um, something that my grandfather was extremely, extremely uh, focused on was the, uh, the, the 
how essential it was for people to, uh, with enthusiasm, take aim at the most intractable problems. Like the, like you know, he used to say to people a lot, assess the field of opportunities and whatever the most difficult uh, problem is, go at that one, and and blow off anybody who tells you that you should not attack the things that are uh, considered, you know, endemic, permanent, uh, intractable. Th those are the, the things that most need people uh, going at them. And I think, I think that, uh, you know, he, he definitely, he definitely um, constantly beat the drum of saying that, that in American life, if we, if we started to accept certain conditions as an endemic reality of entrepreneurial capitalism that we would quickly find ourselves in an increasingly stratified society of extreme wealth, extreme poverty. And, you know, when I watch the, Amer the American, you know, poverty numbers roll from 40 million to now 45 million in the last decade, I think a lot about um, the, the speeches I would see him give to young people in, in which he would say, you know, um, uh, go, go at the hardest, hardest things uh, because none of, these, none of these problems are insoluble. And I think, uh, you know, he really did believe that, 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 um, that the things that come to be defined as, as intractable problems are in fact a, a problem of, of apathy and and complacency, and not um, not a, not a, some sort of systemic um, reality that we have to accept. And I think uh, I think it's a you know all of all of us you know come out of school at some point and and enter the the world. And you know it's it's uh, I think it's exciting. It's exciting to look at these challenges that we're facing, everything Jonathan was laying out, it's like, you know, this, this is it. I mean, this is the, we don't, we're not, I don't think we've got World War II to mobilize us, you know, in this way, but the global challenge of our time is the challenge Jonathan laid out, and, and it's on our plates. And I think, I think, you know, how exciting on one level, um, daunting, but exciting to get offered uh, the opportunity to be the generation that figures out global systemic sustainability. I mean, it will it will be the legacy of the next thousand years, not the next two hundred years. So, so what an amazing opportunity, you know. Can I say something more about design, please? So, the, in this design, extraordinary design really matters. Edward was deeply involved in the creation of the High Line, and if you've anybody who's seen the High Line, it's an amazing piece of design that transformed the neighborhood and actually is one of those things that makes cities more successful. But design in its own sake is irrelevant. To just do amazing design for the sake of amazing design is not enough. The design has to be connected to a higher mission and a higher purpose that it is serving. And then it can be served with, with beauty or it can be served with, with discordance. And by the way, Jim Rouse really understood this and one of the earliest architects an architect that he supported very early in his career for a long time is Frank Gehry. And Enterprise sits today still in a Frank Gehry building. Yeah. Uh, um, it's interesting. The, there's an interesting uh, uh, segue from that, which is even as you were saying the thing about design and function and service, I think that was certainly one of my grandfather's refrains was, was that, uh, you know, form should actually follow function, and that function should be defined by, by service, uh, how it services a community, especially in urban design and planning. But, um, but what's really, uh, I was also thinking about Frank, uh, and you know, just recently I went through a, a, we, an interesting experience of, of exactly that, which was that we were, um, uh, my, my theater company was selected to uh, the, the theater company I got my professional start as an actor in grew into this 
big company, and we got selected to be the um, one of the resident art arts companies for the Ground Zero redevelopment. We were going to be the theater component of a multidisciplinary new uh, arts center on the Ground Zero redevelopment. And Frank, uh, Gary won the architectural uh, competition, got the commission to build a building that would have three theaters for us and two theaters for the Joyce uh, Dance Company. And you know, this was a it was a seven hundred million dollar plus price tag uh, on this building, and you know, it was a hell of a lot of fun to sit in Frank's offices in Santa Monica with the blocks and the tissue paper, and 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 imagine the idea of building something at that scale with the, all of his great way of thinking about form and structure and everything. And you know, very, very quickly, it became apparent that as fun as all of that was, that it was A, um, outscaled out and outpriced uh, to what was appropriate to the site, the times, the economy of the state and the city. And, um, and at a certain point, all of us who were involved in it, I think, had a, a moment you know, in which we had to make a, a, an anticipatory or a preemptive pivot and say, you know what, as amazing as this is, this is not right because it's not right on the fundamentals. And ultimately, we, we moved it. Um, apart from the glacial morass that the Ground Zero Project has become, it, we, we ended up working with the city to move that project up to a West 42nd Street redevelopment where our three theaters are now recited, the same three theaters, the same physical interior footprint, same economic engine for the city, now embedded within a large multi-use uh, development that the related companies are building. Um, you know, a condo tower, uh, a new European efficiency hotel tower, and our theaters are now the base of this large complex. They're not, they're not, a, they're not a Frank Gehry building anymore. And we were really scared at the moment that it came to make that decision um, that, that Frank wouldn't stay with the project because he wasn't building a $700, $700 million building anymore. And not only you know, is he building things at that scale, but there's the, biz the business equation for him was going to be an entirely different equation, uh, almost nominal fees in this new project. Um, and when we went to Frank, he, it, he, he basically went, his immediate response was, oh, that's, that's so much smarter. That's just so much smarter. You know, it's going to cost 10% of what it was going to cost down there. And, and, it's not, and the building isn't the point. He, he said to me, he, was, he said the building wasn't the point. The point is the theaters. Interior design, theaters are about interior design. They're about experiential magic of entering a space. And he, he said, I don't fucking care what what they're inside, he said. Let you know. So they're in big banal towers. Who cares? It's it's more right. It's more right for the city. We're still going to make it magic. We're going to make it magic by being in a in a in a beehive of activity as opposed to this big grand architectural statement. And you know, it. it I was blown away by that. I I thought that. Uh, I th I thought that was um, that was that was the the. That, that was an emblematic example, I think, of, a, of an architect who was thinking about function, purpose, integration with what a community needs, as opposed, as opposed to the glory of his, his designs. And they're going to be really cool theaters. Yeah, and they're, no, they're amazing. You know, they're, they're, he's, these theaters he's designed, the interior of them are they're magnificent. So it's great. You, 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 you made the comment about what a community needs. I, I, I want to quote uh, Rouse again. Our talented designers need to be hauled away from the myopic view of buildings as man-made works of art and lifted up to the bigger view of communities as gardens in which we are growing people and a civilization. Jonathan, you said, you know, the only way we're going to be able to fit all the extra people in the world is in, in, in cities. And, and, and I know in talking to you, Edward, in your work at the UN, you're, ta you're, you're thinking about how to bring... Uh, the message about preserving biodiversity down to the street level, where it's really relevant to people's lives. You know, is there uh, is there sort of a joint solution there in terms of 
finding uh, qualities of communities that are successful so people want to live in them and, and, and uh, don't feel the need. Everybody has to have their own, uh, their, their, their own uh, backyard, if you will. So wh you know, what are the qualities of successful communities? Complex question. They're gardens in which grow people. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so first of all, well, it is a complex question because there are many different kinds of communities. So you could say, can we narrow it to what are the components of successful cities? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So cities, first of all, need economic engines. And cities function out of connectivity. So cities were always on river, on, at seaports, at harbors, at river points, et cetera. They're always, cities, are, if you think about, you know, people kind of spread out, and then some places get bigger and some places don't. And the reason the ones that get bigger get bigger is because there are nodes of, of interconnectivity. And it's not just economic. Uh, economic is good, but it's not good enough. It also has to be cultural. And it has to be, so there has to be intellectual capital ideas flowing, and you get a feedback system. They have to be at transportation nodes. They need a great civic, cultural, and educational infrastructure. So in universities, uh, public schools, uh, uh, charter schools, they need this, uh, theater companies, they need museums, libraries, performing arts centers. If you think about it, for example, there are cities in China that are being built, which I hear of, five, six million people, and it's essentially places to work and places to live. And that's not, that's not, our, that's not a city when you think of Paris or the Sydney Opera House. Or, a city isn't just a dense bunch of buildings. It's got to have this uh, deeper transfer, the, the social, cultural uh, support systems that help transform people. And by the way, also, what happens when you have a university that's a couple hundred years old is that it becomes a carrier of a gene pool of ideas. And then they need, cities will not work unless people have connection with earth, with nature. So they need great parks. We need to restore our rivers. And we're seeing this all across the world now, the taking of rivers back and creating walk, walk, walkways and rebuilding urban parks. Trust for Public Land says no kid should live more than 10, per, 10 minutes away from a park. So you put all those things together, and it begins to make a great city. The other thing, by the way, cities need is leadership. That it's not just about the buildings or the institutions, the connectivity, the airport, and the economy. That without extraordinary leaders who inspire and give a vision and move that forward, cities begin to stagnate. It, to what extent is the Rose uh, Architectural Fellowship uh, tries to maybe help create some of those those leaders, at least on the design side? Can you it talk is a creating bit? those leaders. So let's back History. up. So. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, approximately ten years ago, my father, who had been a great builder but also a great philanthropist, as he was coming to the end of his life, uh, asked me, what can I do? For, you know, all the great things I built were built by amazing architects, and I want to do something for young architects. And so we co-conceived a program that would take young architects um, and place them in community development organizations, which was my passion, and we do this through enterprise, for three years to learn to not only be community designers and design of and from that community, um, but to learn actually how to, how to finance and build. So they go through the life cycle of a project. And um, the program is now more than 10 years old. It is run by Katie Swenson sitting here, who uh, was a Rose Fellow and now is the Rose Mother Fellow. Um, and, um, uh, what is, so what we have found is that we're growing, we're not only growing, we're, so we're, the people who come to us, it's very competitive to become a Rose Fellow, um, uh, have great design skills when they come to us. And you can only get in if you have a history of community uh, commitment, if you, you know, have volunteered and worked with community organizations as part of who you are and your being. Um, what the fellowship is doing is building a learning network. It's providing these fellows mentors. It's connecting to the larger system of enterprise, an amazing support system, but mentors within their cities, mentors within the community development organization. And we're growing extraordinary leaders who most continue to be designers in their careers as they move forward, but they have this larger skill about how you get things done, both politically, financially, on the ground, um, and uh, they're the rock stars of design in the future. You, you mentioned your father and his career as a builder. I understand you got your start working in the family business. Um, 
why did you feel the need to start your own? What was the difference there? Or um, how is your business different from the family business? So my family has a very wonderful real estate business, very honorable, builds very fine, mostly market rate buildings, and uh, manages them exceptionally well. And they're, in New York, really considered the finest management, property management company for residential. I had a different vision, which was that I wanted to really integrate, and, and my family is also very generous and philanthropic and deeply concerned with inner city education, a whole variety of issues, many different family members, different issues. I come out of the Rouse mold that these all are one, and I wanted to create a business that they were all one, and I was seeing peers, so look, I was born in the 50s, came of age in the 60s, I'm a hippie. And, uh, and I, so my colleagues were people like Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream and Gary Hirschberg of Stonyfield Yogurt. And there were a bunch of us that were all, that came out of that time period who we were trying to say, how do we integrate all the things we believe in into one business? And it really, it was inspired by them and Nita Roddick of the Body Shop, et cetera, that I saw there, saw there was a model to create a new kind of business, a new kind of real estate business that was, that tried to integrate all of these things, the mission-based real estate for-profit business. And so I left with great blessing from my father, because he knew that's who I really was, to go out and see if I could take that and make it work. Uh, Edward, you've recently launched a business, CrowdRise. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why, why you did that and how it works? Um, yeah, it, it, uh, CrowdRise is a it's a social networking platform that that focuses specifically on on uh, capacitating grassroots fundraising and organizational fundraising, individual and organizational um, online fundraising, and uh, it um, it grew out of it, it grew very organically out of experiences that I had. Uh, as a as a board member and active participant in numerous types of causes, from theater companies to the Highline to things like conservation efforts, the 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 recognition that these organizations that I were in, was involved with were not uh, doing a good job at figuring out the the, tr the, the true potential in contemporary kind of networking and communication tools. You know, a, a shocking number of organizations are, are and have been um, uh, limiting their use of the quote unquote internet to essentially like digitizing their annual report and, and not really breaking through into a, a new a, a new kind of relationship with um, connecting to their own support networks and and I went through I specifically I went through one experience of pulling together I, you know we pulled together a, a team of people to to run the New York Marathon as a team for the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust we had three of the guys come over from Kenya, the Maasai guys that we work with. And um, we, when we looked around to try to figure out what mechanism we were gonna use to, pr to use, to, to invite people to participate and sponsor the team and all these things, I was so, we were so, a group of us were so unimpressed with what was out there um, that we just decided to build it ourselves. And so we, we built our own we built our own web-based site, um, and we we raised you know thir with 30 runners in the marathon. We raised more money in 40 days than some of the huge organizations um, did with 300 runners and all of their development capacity and everything. And and we knew what we were doing. We thought we knew what we were doing, but when it was over, we we had so many people coming at us saying you know, how did you crack that, or what can you talk with our development teams about what you did, we need to do that kind of thing. And we just sort of decided, um, we sort of decided we don't, have the, we don't have the time to talk to all these people, and we're, we'll just build it ourselves um, and, and make it available 
to people and organizations um, to assist them in, in doing the same kind of thing. Um, you know, in some ways it was like a time, it was supposed to be like a way of not spending so much time on it and then it turned into, I'm spending four times as much time <coughs> on it. Um, but it's but it's been a lot of fun and it, it it's it's definitely really interesting. You know, it's I think about a million dollars a month is being donated through the site now, um, and it's it's been rapidly expanding uh, in terms of people and groups adopting it. It's it's very interesting. We're learning a lot and we're refining it as we go. And um, I think that our goals were to increase people's capacity to make an individual impact, but then also from the perspective of being a board member on a lot of these organizations, we wa we want, I, w I believed we could and we wanted to try to create a, a radical new efficiency for organizations because all of us who are involved in any kind of nonprofit work know that the, the dirty truth of it is that is that you never just raise money, you spend a lot of money to raise money and the yield on that is often not as good as you want it to be. You, when you do event-driven fundraising, uh, people don't like to talk about it, but they often spend 50% you know, of what they raise to, to have a big dinner party or whatever, and, and working on down into the most sort of young, dynamic, web-based organizations, they're still often spending 15% you know, uh, in development and communications costs. And we've, we thought we would try to build something that you know, would, would uh, help organizations access new money at a cost of under 8%. That was our goal. We wanted, to, we wanted to be twice as efficient as the most efficient models that we could find out there. And, we, and I think we're succeeding in that. We're, we're getting um, a rapturous response from the recipient organizations, which uh, in, terms of, in terms of that efficiency. So that, that was something we were aiming at, and it's been going pretty well. I just realized we have this slide up here. <laughs> so maybe, uh, Jonathan, we can ask you to talk about it. And then I think, Doug, you can probably cut them there. The slides were, were held in reserve in case Jonathan needed them. So, And that's actually a different presentation. But that's oh. Cool. It's, it's got enough slides. But I don't need to. Do you, the, the slides are just if. Let's keep going. OK. We don't need I think slides. you can cut that, uh, Doug. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, well, maybe, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. Unless any of you, either of you, have some questions. Any questions from the audience? Or? So can I just, I want to say something about the High Line. Okay. I thought you were going to say more about the High Line. Oh, okay. Great. So here's the amazing thing. These two guys, who were fairly ordinary, to be honest, who were fairly, I'm going to give another example of that, too, and who, um, but just felt a passion about this rail line, this uh, elevated rail, this old, crummy piece of infrastructure, that it could be something new. And they gathered momentum, their, their own commitment and passion, and they began showing a community means, they built groups around it. They, and, and lo and behold, this amazingly visionary, magnificent transformation of the city happened from just two guys. I mean. It, that's definitely true. I, I, the, I mean, for people in the phase that you guys are in, you, you, you couldn't find in my view, uh, a more heroic example of some young people that took on a Quixote-esque um, project and, and triumphed so audaciously that they're going to go down in history. These guys are going to go down with Jane Jacobs and Jackie Onassis as people who achieved a transformative uh, permanent piece of the magic of New York City. And, and literally, one of them was a, was a an editor, a freelance editor of online journals, and the other one was sort of a consultant to, in, in the era of kind of New York's brief.com boom, and they literally both went, neither of them had design planning, uh, uh, they didn't have design planning experience, they didn't have urban development experience. Um, they didn't have fundraising experience. They didn't have fundraising experience, and they met at I don't even know why they went, I still don't know why they went to the community board meeting that they went to where they met. They just went to a community board meeting about the, the, the plans for the, no one even called it the High Line then. It was just this abandoned freight, elevated freight rail track through the west side of Manhattan. Um, I used to live over it 
and wonder what the hell it was. And, and, and these guys, independently, not knowing each other, both went to a meeting because they were just interested in, in hearing that this thing was supposed to be torn down, found that the whole conversation was being dictated basically by parking garage owners who wanted the reversion of air rights once the right of eminent domain returned to property owners from the tearing down of the track. And one of them raised his hand and said, I'm just curious why nobody's talking about any form of creative redevelopment of this you know, 1930s steel Art Deco infrastructure. And he basically just got shouted down by, by the Edison parking garage people um, <laughs> saying, you know, it, this is fait accompli. That's all been talked about. It's not happening, blah, 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 blah. And the other guy, uh, Robert, came up to Joshua afterwards and said, you know, I was wondering the same thing. Like, this is so stupid. Let's have coffee. And they initially started this group called the Friends of the High Line um, to, in Joshua's living room, and started, like, putting up flyers and kind of having little parties. It was really just advocacy to intervene on behalf of, you know, the saving of the structure without any even real notion that it was going to be a, a park. That wasn't even in the beginning. And, I mean, you know, what, what these guys pulled off is so outrageous that it, it's hard to believe. But in, like, in 10 years, in 10 years, they went, they took something that was in the hands of parking garage owners, a major rail company, and the city of New York that was en route to being torn down. And 10 years later, it's the largest new public space built in Manhattan, you know, or created in Manhattan since Central Park. And it, and it, and they raised $150 million uh, to get it done. And now they both do it full time and, you know, have every, everyone who actually spent the time and money to get a degree in, in design and planning, asking them to speak to them about, like, things. And Robert and Josh were always going, like, I don't know anything about urban design. Like, <laughs> like don't, don't ask me about it. So it's like, I, I think um, they are, like, that, that's, a, that's something to check out and go see, because they are, that is, like, one of the great stories of citizen advocacy and uh, proactivity and just not listening to anybody who told them that they couldn't build a park two stories up in Manhattan. It's just, it's just an absolutely inspirational story. We take a few questions. Yep. Uh, Rick, we've got, not, got a microphone. I've been a fan of James Rouse uh, from my earliest days. In fact, he was the first speaker I ever had come anywhere as a student at Yale back in the 60s just after uh, he was telling the story of walking into uh, uh, the commissioners in uh, Maryland and saying, I now own 16,000 acres in your county. <laughs> I, I have two questions. Uh, one for Edward. Uh, were you ever inclined to go into the family business, the family real estate business? And two, uh, these are very difficult times. I know uh, uh, Rouse uh, essentially lost Columbia, though he did very well in the shopping center business. Uh, what would he say today about how to deal with these very challenging uh, fiscal times as far as making the kind of impact that you all are talking about? Um, so I, ne I, never, I never really saw it as the family business particularly, um, although my uncle uh, Ted became a, a really tremendous develop force in progressive development in Baltimore as well. Um, uh, my, my father was was uh, in conservation, uh, and in, in some sense, I've gotten involved in his business. But um, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I, I love being involved in enterprise. Uh, I never. I still walk past. I still, when I'm involved in things like building these theaters, or when I'm walking around at home in New York, I literally have said sometimes, I, I could never be a real estate developer because I, I have no head for it. I don't understand it. Like, I look at people like Jonathan, I'm like, how do they do that? You know, I, I, I don't, I, it, it wasn't intuitive to me. Um, but, but through enterprise, uh, you know, the kinds of things Jonathan was talking about, the, the, idea, the, the idea of a holistic approach to cities um, is, is really, is very compelling to me. And I think it's an organization I happen to understand the strange complexities of, um, 
because I worked there when I got out of school and uh, I, I love being involved with enterprise it's a it's a um, it's almost one of those organizations that it's very it's its strengths are its challenges in the sense that it's it's a highly highly innovative and complex uh, set of mechanisms and innovations for dealing with the complex problem of cities. It's, it's and as a result, it's very hard to explain to people. It's, it's, a, it's not like, you know, uh, breast cancer or, or uh, poverty. It's, it's, it's very hard to get people to understand the dynamics of affordable housing and the lack of affordable housing and, and how it's a driver on other social issues and the weird public-private <coughs> mechanisms that you've got to stitch together to effectively come up with ways of getting affordable housing built in a market rate environment um, and how you can use innovative products like the low-income housing tax credit to stimulate market rate investment in a sector of the market that's not being addressed by either cities or private development. It's, you know, it takes 20 minutes to an hour to explain the way enterprise works. And, and I like that. I think it makes it, um, it means you don't end up in conversation. You don't waste your time trying to sell it to, to stupid people. You, you, <laughs> you, you have to go find smart people who you know are gonna get, they're, they're, who have the chops to understand it and that when you get them, like Jonathan Rose, you're gonna really have them for life and, and you're gonna have the intellectual assets of, of some of the smartest people in the world. And I, I, like, um, I like being involved in, in, in those kind of complexities and I definitely like retaining that connection to the work my grandfather was doing. Um, but, but I've never been, a, a, I've never had a head for real estate particularly other than that. Um, I don't know, you know, my, my the Rouse Company, the Rouse Company became something very different. Not not really after my grandfather left it, but after he died. Um, I don't I don't think he would. I don't, I don't I don't think he believed in things existing forever. I think he he believed in dynamism and change. I don't think he would have. I think I think he'd be very happy still with on the whole, with what Columbia Maryland represents. Um, but. Uh, you know, I, I think he would say. I think he would say that uh, recessionary moments or moments like we're going through times of economic challenge. I think he believed really profoundly that those were often drivers to dynamism. In fact, the Enterprise Foundation, the concept of enterprise, was actually born in the depth of his despair about the Reagan era pullback from HUD and and investment through the traditional governmental pipelines, he, enterprise and its mechanisms, even the low-income housing tax credit, which he helped conceive and author, were responses to the constriction that he, and the crisis that he felt were emerging. So I, I think he would, I think he would admonish people to use times like the ones we're in as an inspiration to innovate, um, not, not, not to feel, you know, more daunted by. And I would only say that um, my instinct was that he went through a lot of boom times and bust times. And during, so if he was running a company in this time, he would do just enough to deal with the financialists and then have lots of other people deal with them too and try and sweet talk his bankers and he's very charming and all that stuff. And yet I could absolutely see him at a meeting in which somebody is wanting to foreclose on a mall and he's there to save the mall and at the same time try and fundraise from the guy for enterprise and remind the guy about all the poor people in his community and what their needs are and, uh, and just wrap it all into one. He was good at juggling. Good juggling. Next question. Daniel? When you ask the question, if you can just say who, your name and who you are. Uh, my name is Daniel Diaz. I'm Interbrand. Uh, why don't you grab the microphone? Hi, my name is Daniel Diaz, and I'm with Interbrand. My question is for you, Edward, and it's about CrowdRise. You know, I do a lot of pro bono work for HRC, and we throw these great big galas all over the country, and they're $400 a ticket, and, you know, you tend to get a lot of 
wealthy, you know, white men to come to these dinners and give money, and you end up seeing not a lot of young people there really engaged in, in what the organization is doing. And I and what you've done is you've given young people and people with more limited means uh, the ability to affect real change financially on on great organizations. The next question or the thing I'd ask is, how are you then connecting them in in a real way beyond finances? How are you getting them moving them toward those organizations so they can use their talents and their passion in a in a in a physical way to actually connect uh, connect with, so with with what you're doing or yeah. mm, you know I, I you can't take responsibility for every part of the equation i mean we're we were very focused on we were we are very focused at the moment on on how do you create more efficient um, next generation fundraising mechanisms to give I do, you know, you can't take for granted that young people, uh, it is a kind of empowerment to give young people tools through which they feel they can um, impact things, impact the world. And, and, um, and I think, be, you know, beyond, uh, beyond donating, I think more, it's more about giving people the tool to do something other than donate themselves, but rather to take proactive action through tools that they're facile with, conversant with. Um, and, and I mean, there's almost a gaming component to it, frankly. It's encouraging people, it's daring them to get creative with a robust mechanism that lets them do a lot of the things they're familiar with from gaming to social networking and to use it toward a purpose. Um, we've even promoted, we think, uh, and a somewhat obvious, but and yet somewhat novel idea, um, which is that you know you have these enormous America's a America's an, in, an incredibly uh, has a has a very robust culture of volunteering. Apart from fundraising, we 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 have massive massive volunteer based organizations in this country and. Um, in every form and shape at all ages. And one of the things we've been promoting is the idea that, you know, why do we, why do we look to like marathons and skate-a-thons and walk-a-thons to be like some sort of emblem of, I'm taking this action, now, now back me, fundraise for me. What we're starting to say is, if you build houses for Habitat for Humanity, treat it like a marathon. Go out and say, I, I'm giving, I'm, I'm taking action, I'm doing this. Reach out to your friends and family and say, I want to raise 500 bucks for Habitat for Humanity for building a home. Will you sponsor me for my my volunteering or my my you know my teaching whatever? And I think um, uh, you know again, how do you leverage? How do you create new forms of of leverage uh, uh, to help people um, be both efficient and productive? I mean, I think you know to me, I, I worked. During Obama's campaign, I worked a good bit with some of the social media folks, and a lot of people talked about how he, with no comment on the politics at all, just as a, as a systemic revolution, a lot of people talked about how he did such, you know, this, this, the 63 million discrete donors, you know, the, the number of small donors. What people talked about, I think, I was shocked at how little attention was paid to a sub fact within that, which was that they got, they got incredible conversion rates on getting people who donated under $100 to raise a multiple of what they gave, just by giving them very rudimentary tools for exactly what we're talking about. And that was kind of what we, that was one of the, the drive, the kind of insights we thought needed teasing out more. More people needed to be given a more robust version of that, which is the ability to, to lever their own capacity, in a way, uh, not to be academic about it, but to, but to do more than they could give. And, and, and the more that people get comfortable with these tools, I think the more we're going to see that rallying, the rallying of the 60s, is starting to become virtual rallying. It's starting to become um, crowdsourcing, is starting to go from the white noise of just social, I don't even want to call it empty social interaction, but it, 
its social interaction, now it's starting to mature. And some of its uses are starting to refine and become very productive, I think. And, um, and I, th I think that's really exciting. I think it's really exciting to see uh, these, these kind of new tangible impacts that can come from what a lot of people were dismissing as just, you know, social chatter, you know? Take a question from a student. Somebody in the back, uh, in the white, a white shirt? Yes. Um, both of you have done some extraordinary things, and it's hard to imagine that either of you have ideas that you haven't been able to um, come to fruition with. Uh, and I was wondering if you do, if there are things that are sort of on the back burner and you haven't really worked out how to make it happen. I one day want to build my Columbia, Maryland. I mean, I, um, our work is increasing in size of scale, and, um, and I aspire for that scale to get larger and larger. You should do it in China. Yeah. <laughs> well, there they build it, uh, they, they just do it, they even larger isn't, scale. Isn't, sir, isn't Bill McDonough doing kind of a, a planned community in China? I, Bill did design one. Uh, there, there have been other examples that have been probably more successful. They didn't actually build it? Uh, it, was, it was built, my, it, I haven't been there, so okay. I can't say, gotcha. but my understanding was it's not been one of the stellar successes. Gotcha. But there's a huge amount of interesting work going on. I'm actually planning on going to China in the spring just to see it. An amazing amount of stuff going on in China. Um, they, the best that I feedback I get is they're really trying to learn, but at the same time they're building a cold, cold fire power plant a week and they're, they're just chomping out huge swaths of real estate development because they've got to house their population, they've got to create energy while they're trying to improve, but they're not stopping. They also are deeply committed to infrastructure, so it's embarrassing. You know, they have high-speed trains, we don't. They have, you know, they decided in 10 years they're going to entirely make the city of um, Shanghai subway accessible everywhere, and they, you know, we have two subway bores going away in New York, not building enough, they have 86. I mean, it's just a whole other scale of commitment. Um, I don't, I don't, there's, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get things done that don't seem like they're gonna get done. I, mm, I mean, some, I, I, I relate to Jonathan's sensation that, that taking some things that we've put into motion and, and taking them out to their fullest sort of scaled iteration of themselves is um, lot, lots of things, yeah, that I'd like to see done. I mean, some things I'd just like to get done so that I never have to work on them ever again, ever. Um, it's sort of like the, the ongoing senior essay experience of life, just like, <laughs> is this ever going to be done? Um, and I have those things, but other things, I think I, it's not so much new categories, it's that I, I, would, I would like to see sort of the co-centric mm. circles on things I'm working on get to that, that bigger scale. Take another question. There's a, there's a gray shirt. I can't see anything, uh, uh, arm, or an arm with a gray shirt. Ah, there, it's a person attached, good. Hi, I'm a student at uh, the law school. My question is, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about the current housing crisis and are there mechanisms mechanisms and tools from your uh, holistic approach that can be applied to the housing crisis in cities today that might uh, alleviate some of the problems that communities are facing uh, because of the crisis? And also, looking forward, are there uh, different approaches we could take in terms of planning communities and planning cities that might prevent a repeat uh, real estate housing crisis in the future? Um. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, there, there, was a ha there was an affordable housing crisis in America before this latest downturn, and now there's, you know, we've really got a housing crisis in America, obviously compounded now by the, by the foreclosure crisis and the collapse of credit and all this stuff. But, the, but e even, even sidelining sort of the particulars, intensities of the moment, I think, um, yes, I think people, I think this country's for a long time uh, been skating blithely over an, an, an underlying reality of 
of a terrible, terrible lack of affordable housing in America. You've got enormous, enormous populations of people in this country who are, you know, sort of a paycheck away from homelessness or, or are paying much, much too high a percentage of their disposable income to live where they live and are therefore constantly in threat of destabilizing crisis, um, not able to invest in their kids' education, home loans, businesses, whatever. So afford, uh, the, the lack of affordable housing has so many reverberating implications for America and the failure of market rate development and government to, f to fill, you know, to meet the need in between them has been an enormous problem in America in the last, really since the, you know, the, the beginning of suburban development and white flight and abandonment of the inner city in the 60s, really. And I think, um, I think that You know, in the 80s, um, my grandfather and a, and a lot of other people tried to look at the problem um, and figure out, in essence, how, how do we bridge that gulf? And things like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which if you're not familiar with, the, you know, is a federal tax credit program. It's very appreciated and celebrated on both sides of the political aisle because it, it incentivizes investment in equity funds that are dedicated to affordable housing development by giving a boosted return on a boosted return in the form of a federal tax credit and you know that little bit of of financial and you know innovation became an astonishing engine across the last 25 years i mean it's been one of the most significant mechanisms for driving private equity into affordable housing development in this country's history, certainly in the last few years. And what's really interesting about it is when it kicked off, and even when I got out of college and was first working in New York on uh, within Enterprise's program to renovate New York City's multifamily abandoned building stock through these tax credit equity deals, there, was, um, there weren't that many people who had caught on to what a good idea it was, and now Enterprise didn't have that much competition for the tax credit deals. Now, huge companies and huge banks realized, hey, that's a, that's, those, those are good margins and we should get into that, and the, and the tax credit was such a good idea that it got very competitive, and in a weird way for the social mission organizations like Enterprise, it, it actually became um, Success brought a lot of competition, but that's good. Uh, what we all find ourselves talking about a lot, you know, I end up at sort of real estate council dinners with Jonathan and other people I know in the field, and Sean Donovan at HUD, and um, is that what's needed, what's really badly needed, is for the next generation of in, of people coming out of you know law school and business school and graduate school of design, to think that way, to think in an innovative way about what are going to be the new innovative packaged mechanisms that create these kinds of market-based drivers on getting certain things done. You know, is it gonna be, is it gonna be real estate energy ta credits? You know, are we, are we gonna end up finding ways to aggregate energy credits and use those to, you know, who knows? Who knows what it's going to be? But, but that's what's needed. Like, when I look at what do I think is needed, what, what do people like you have to come up with? It's like someone's got to come up with the next low-income housing tax credit type idea the, um, and, and, and figure out ways to stitch together market rate incentives with sort of social need, with um, public policy to get it done in a way that works for everybody. Um, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of where I think, you know, and to Jonathan's enormous credit, because he was one of the main, main um, voices crying for it, you know, it, it's important that in affordable housing development, 
we start to confront the questions of efficiency and sustainability just as the lead standards are pushing that in market rate development. The, you know, Jonathan, you know, with support from a lot of us, but definitely was one of the leaders in, in pushing for a sustainability standard in the affordable housing models. Um, and that's been a huge innovation in the last 10 years uh, because nobody, everybody thought, you know, that the cost premiums would be too high to, to deal with sustainability in affordable housing models. And it turns out it's just not true at all. Um, in fact, those things can be done in some ways more efficiently in affordable housing models. And so I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an incredibly dynamic field um, and it needs, it needs people thinking in innovative ways in design, in planning, in financing. Um, it's very, very rich. Very rich set of challenges. So can I make just one quick comment on this? You can take, Which is make a, a, a long comment. Well, I'm going to be quick because I want to hear more questions. But the current financial crisis is completely and only the result of a huge scam, a multi-tiered scam. This is a in in which people the no document loans. So people were borrowing who shouldn't be borrowing. They were being sold products they shouldn't have been sold. The, and it goes all the way, and the complicity goes from mortgage brokers and title insurance companies and lawyers and people on Wall Street who are packaging and selling, and it was a whole system that was not doing any good for the world, or very, very little good was done. And the net consequence is that um, in the disruption of poverty, actually people on Wall Street are still doing okay, and there's a huge amount of unemployment. And really, what pe although we continue to build affordable housing and deeply believe in rebuilding these cities, as I said, 90 million people are coming, so we've got to create places for them. What people really need are the jobs to afford, ho afford housing right now. I, one thing I'd add to that, that that really irks me is that, you know, there, there were, you know, you see these horribly ironic and really um, unjust forms of intellectual blowback on some things that were actually good ideas, like the Community Reinvestment right. Act. Um, you know, and if, for those of you who are familiar, like CRA was a, was actually a, a very, very good and a very important idea. And for the people who were, the banks that were managing those, the, you know, the principals and, and the, uh, who, who were, who were pursuing sort of the, what the Community Reinvestment Act was all about in a, in a rigorous way, they, they weren't doing, you know, the, the Community Reinvestment Act has gotten tarred right. as a part of this collapse as though it was emblematic of the kinds of things Jonathan was talking about. And the truth is, it, the, it wasn't. It was bad actors who were, who were, you know, whipping up all these toxic mortgages, knowing exactly what they were doing. And, you know, and I, and I think that um, it's, it's a shame in a way to see to some degree that the Community Reinvestment Act is getting, it's almost like you know, getting tossed out with the garbage even though there was a lot of really good ideas in it. So not, just as a fact, 93% of bad mortgages uh, are suburban. So you hear, oh, it's all those poor people in the inner city who borrowed too much and they were done. They over leveraged themselves and all that. It's not at all. That's not at all the case. It was, uh, it was as I said, it was over nine to one, a suburban phenomenon. Take a few more. All the way in the back, in purple. Hi there, I'm from the business school, and I'm just interested in understanding when we talk about sustainable cities, dense urban living, greening them, a holistic approach. To me, transportation infrastructure is a really big part of that. And we have some cities that have great transportation infrastructure, and as we grow and as we get denser, it's outdated. And I, I'm just, it seems like the government's not really willing to invest, the private sector's not really willing to take that on, and I'm curious what you think the solution is, and not just sort of what, what ought to happen, but really what could get done to improve and update infrastructure so that we can accommodate dense cities. So it's a perfect question, and the reality is that 
China is investing a trillion dollars in high-speed rail and, and urban transportation infrastructure. Uh, Russia is investing a trillion dollars not only in high-speed passenger rail but high-speed freight rail. Um, India, I think it's Arthur's here. Is it 500 million billion that they're investing in, in in new rail infrastructure? Brazil is the rest of the world completely gets it. We're being so far left behind, and there's really only one way to do it, and that is with government. Uh, and I really believe these are government assets. There's a huge movement for public-private partnerships. And the reality is that, which I still don't really understand, how having some private company build your urban infrastructure, own it, operate it, is actually cheaper than having the government do it. It, it, I, I, it doesn't sit right with me. I've seen, but anyway, we'll, but however it gets done, it ultimately needs public subsidy, and it's just one of those investments one needs to make as a country into one's future. Um, and we simply don't have the political will to do it, and there's only one way to do that, and to raise taxes. And one of the key ones to raise is the gasoline tax. And, um, and the countries, I'll give you a really perfect example. In 1960, Birmingham, Alabama, um, and uh, Atlanta, Georgia were the exact same size. And Delta Airlines went first to Birmingham and said, we want to put a big airport here. And Birmingham said no, because they were afraid the Delta employees were going to unionize them. And so they went on to Atlanta second. And look at the difference between those two cities now because of their transportation infrastructure. It's a complete, uh, we're not going to have a viable, it's a, a complete key to a, a prosperous growing economy. And so the unwillingness to pay for that future investment for our future now is um, unwise. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I had a really interesting experience all, this time last year. I, I went out to, um, I went out to pa Papua New Guinea and, and we had to fly, we flew uh, through, it of connect through uh, a little town on the tip of the Indonesian island Sulawesi called Makassar. And so I thought, I've been to Indonesia a lot, but I've never been to Makassar. I thought, in my head, of course, I did that thing where I went, oh, this, that'll, be, that'll be an interesting landing strip, you know, like, or that'll be, I did all, I projected all that kind of, ooh, you know, this is gonna be, this is gonna be out there and third world and rough and everything. And we landed, and a bunch of us, and we walked into the airport in Makassar, Sulawesi, and it was so much nicer than JFK <laughs> or, or LAX right. or any of the dives that we enter our cities through now, and it was so depressing to me. I, I, I just stand, stood there looking at all of its like gleaming, efficient, fantastic beauty in this tiny little provincial airport in Indonesia, and I... I mean, it's scary when you get out into the world, if you're lucky enough to, and you see what the baseline is on infrastructure, transportation infrastructure around the world. Like, we are, we are, I don't know what drug everybody is sipping here that they think the United States is like some, you know, first world party, but it is, it's like, it's, it's staggering to me to get around the world and see the investment that the rest of the world is making while we do all the different things we're doing to spend money. Um, but but it, it really is, uh, it, you know, I, I, I sometimes, I do wonder sometimes, like, you know, is it going to take, what's it going to take? Is it going to take, do bridges have to literally go down, like in Minnesota, do the, you know, what, what's got to happen for people to go, huh, like, that's not supposed to happen, you know, like, I don't know. We'll take one more question from Jim Stockard. I couldn't resist um, after the comments you just made. Um, one has the feeling that we as designers and planners uh, have not found our voice to persuade our political leadership of the kinds of things you all have been talking about tonight. Um, what do we need to do to find that voice, to be persuasive so that the people who have their fingers more tightly on the purse strings um, come to their senses and realize that we ought to adapt some of these principles as a way of 
of reshaping our cities and indeed reshaping our country. We, prettier pictures, better speeches, uh, what's the answer? Because I, I would tell you that this room right here is full of people who have some of those ideas. And I want us to know how in the next generation they will persuade the people who are in another room in this university uh, that these are the kinds of, of things we have to do. <laughs> You're the communicator, you go. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, I don't know, I, I think, uh, I, I really do, I, I, I wonder that all the time. I just, I, um, I do think that, that I do think young people have to take the attitude that, that on some levels, they're just going to do it. Like that, that you, you, that like Joshua and Robert and the High Line, which is, you know, it, it, you have to be careful. It, it's a great story. It's not, it doesn't equate with the massive political will that's needed to do essential infrastructure, which that's not. Um, but, I do think, I do think people have to sort of have faith that if they can dream it up, um, and and if it can win, I mean, certainly we're entering an era where, in, in a par in a parallel challenge, a parallel and related challenge of climate shift or, you know, sustainability problems. I mean, uh, Jonathan and I were just talking about a presentation we've both heard from a guy in the UN. Um, named Pavan Sukta, who, where is he out of, like Bonn, Germany or something? He's, uh, he's actually out of London. Yeah, okay. He, he's just come out with a thing, uh, you can look it up, it's called, um, it's called The Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversities. And it's an incredible, it's an incredible document. It basically just arms it, 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 it arms conservation in the 21st century with an absolute like hammer of Thor in terms of an economic argument that, that, that this isn't about tree hugging or fish kissing or intangible, intangible values or spiritual values or aesthetic values or anything. It's pure economic suicide to make certain kinds of choices to deconstruct natural systems and it's so well it's so well structured and argued and everything and i do think that you know it it's uh i do think that we need those parallels we need those parallel arguments you you need like you need the the overwhelming logic of 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 economic you know, competing in the economic field. I think at the end of the day, unfortunately, people listen, people, people are more compelled that, by that than by most other things. And I think, um, I think that, that we've, we've got to figure out the ways that, um, that we can, you know, uh, as you said, sometimes you have to make it simple and you have to make it um, visceral, but I I think that I think it's got to be. I often think it's got to be one. It's got to be one on the at at the balance sheet level on on many levels, and then and then I also just think I do think it's really. I mean, this will sound more subversive, but I do I do think like more young people have to start embracing and and. Uh, shouting like we're not number one, you know, we're not like we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, like we're mm. we're you know we need to we we need to collectively promote a reboot on our sense of self because we're we're not who we act like we are, and and I think that that on a deeper level is is something that people can figure out their own way of doing. Actually, from a math and science. Point of view, teenagers in America are from number 47, which means countries not only like Poland, but I believe Indonesia are ahead of us. I mean, it's just extraordinary, the gap that we have to overcome. So to me, I'm trying to remember the name. Who's the guy in 1992 in the presidential election, the third party candidate whose whole issue is the deficit? 
Ross Perot, right? Okay, so Ross Perot ran an independent campaign. It was all about the deficit. And what actually happened after that was Graham Rundman and everybody, he didn't win, but the idea won. And there was actually a serious focus on deficit reduction up until the Bush administration. So um, they got distracted. So, um, so I actually think that what could really galvanize this is two, two separate strategies, but one is if, if Bloomberg actually does an independent third party uh, and he's big on infrastructure, candidacy, and he runs on that issue and says this is for our environment, it's economic, and it, it's jobs at home, and all this stuff, and he just, that becomes the core of his campaign. He may or may not win, but I believe a person like that could have the impact that in, by 2012, it is the issue that America wakes up and realizes. Um, the second thing is the media, for example, if Fox actually had the guts to come out and do this story over and over and over again, like the other things they're doing over and over again. I mean, there is an ability to put a message firmly in a, American consciousness, but it takes somebody with a lot of money and big and powerful who's relentless about it to do it. But anyway, I think the 2012, to make it the election of the 2012 campaign um, would be the best chance we have. How about the two of you? I'm just what? Oh, <laughs> you mean out promoting yeah. this idea? Sure, we'll join you up there, and we agree. I, I did things on the High Line that yeah. will, uh, you know, make for make it so I can't get elected. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we better end before we say anything else like that. <laughs> uh, thanks very much to our two speakers.